the ancient city of Jericho, where gods of stone and wood held sway, a young woman named Rahab found herself ensnared in a life of darkness. Her body, a commodity traded for mere coins, was a prison, her soul a battleground where chaos reigned. Rahab's days were a monotonous cycle of hollow laughter and empty embraces, her nights a haunting symphony of longing and despair. Built into the city walls, far away from the bustle of the city center, her home was a place of isolation, a dwelling that mirrored her present condition. In the hidden recesses of her heart, a serpent's coil tightened, binding her to a life she never chose, a life that left her broken, abused, and empty. Yet in the dark hollow of her existence, a spark began to glow. Whispers had reached her ears of a God unlike any other, a God who breathed life into the lifeless, who guided the lost, who fought for the weak, a God who knew her before the world was formed, who would be to her what quite possibly she had never known, a loving Father with a warm embrace. For the Lord says this, You were sold for nothing, and you will be redeemed, but not with money. The stories reached her ears like distant echoes of a melody she had never heard, but had always longed for. Tales of seas parting to make way for the desperate, of fountains pouring forth from solid stone to satiate the thirsty soul, of a pillar of fire guiding a people through the darkest of nights. These were not mere legends, they were living testimonies of a God who dwelt among his people. Rahab's faith was not born of a sudden revelation, it was a slow awakening, a dawning realization that there was more to life than her present existence, and that there was a God more real than the lifeless carved images she had bowed to for so long. Rahab longed for something genuine, a connection to something eternal. In her pain, she cried out, and God, like a loving father, responding to the desperate cries of his daughter, heard Rahab and answered her call. Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The death of Moses, the great liberator of Israel, had left a void in the hearts of the Hebrew people, his death and burial still shrouded in mystery. A larger-than-life figure, he had led the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage through the wilderness to the brink of the Promised Land. Now his protege, Joshua, had assumed command, standing at the threshold of destiny. Joshua's supernatural encounter with the captain of the hosts had fortified his resolve. A divine commission, a celestial affirmation, had set his course. The land of promise awaited, but it was a land occupied by formidable foes, and Jericho, with its towering walls, stood as a sentinel, barring the way. With strategic wisdom, Joshua sent two daring men into Jericho. Their mission was clear, to gather intelligence, to discern the spiritual climate, to pave the way for conquest. These two spies found refuge in the home of the woman named Rahab, a name reminiscent of the land from which they had just been delivered. But where Egypt had been a house of bondage, Rahab's home was a refuge. Her budding faith in the God of Israel kindled by the stories of his mighty deeds, had opened her door to these strangers. Her house, once a place of shame, became a sanctuary for God's chosen. The spies, recognizing the hand of providence, made a covenant with Rahab. In the same manner that the Israelites had left Egypt with blood on the doorposts, they instructed her to place a scarlet thread in her window a token of her redemption. This scarlet thread would secure her life and the lives of her family and the oncoming attack by the army of Israel. It was a promise, 
a foreshadowing of an even greater redemption in which she was now a participant. The scarlet hue of the cord, rich and vivid, was certainly a reminder of the stains of the sins of her past, but it was also a prophecy of a coming deliverance and a blood that would finally wash her clean. It was this strange scarlet cord dyed in crimson made from the body of the scarlet worm that we learn of the depths of God's love and how far he's willing to reach in order to save his own. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. In the heartlands of ancient Israel, where the sun kissed the earth with a golden embrace, lay a region of unparalleled beauty and prosperity. The Mediterranean was not merely a cradle of civilization, but a crossroad of destinies, a land where history and prophecy intertwined, where the mundane met the mystical. Here the fertile soil, nourished by gentle rains and enriched by the sea's salty breeze, bore witness to the Creator's generosity. Olive groves stretched across the rolling hills, vineyards flourished in the valleys, and the fragrance of prized herbs filled the air. It was a land of abundance, yet it whispered secrets, hiding truths in the shadows of its splendor. The Mediterranean's strategic location made it a hub of ancient geopolitics, a meeting place for empires, a nexus of trade, and a theater of human drama. Precious goods from far and wide found their way to its bustling markets, where the exchanges of spices, textiles, and ideas shaped not just economies, but souls. Amidst this grandeur, on the rugged slopes and hidden glades grew the mighty Kermes oak, a tree, strong and unyielding. It stood as a symbol of strength and fortitude, yet it bore a mystery, a stain of red on its branches, a mark of the Tola Ot, the scarlet worm. This humble scale insect, unnoticed by many, silently prophesied about the destiny of its own creator. Its life cycle, a vivid allegory, was a foreshadowing of a sacrifice yet to come. With a determination that belied her fragile form, the Kermes echinatus, or female scarlet worm, would attach herself to the bark of the Kermes oak, never to be moved again, her body forming a protective shell that would become her final resting place. Beneath this hardened shell, she would lay her eggs, her offspring cocooned close to her body. As they grew, her very own body would become their food, her lifeblood nourishing them. This worm would give her life so that her offspring might live. The red dye that was the hallmark of her existence would stain her children becoming a permanent reminder of her sacrifice. For three days, this process would continue, the mother giving herself entirely for the sake of her young. Her body would then transform into a white, wool-like wax. The children, now nourished and strong, would emerge, covered with the crimson hue of their mother's love. This life cycle, so simple yet so profound, was a living parable. It spoke of a love that gives without reservation, that sacrifices without expectation, that redeems without condition. The scarlet worm sacrifice was ultimately a reflection of a greater sacrifice, a foreshadowing of an unrelenting love that would manifest on Calvary. Just as the mother worm attached herself to the tree, so would Jesus attach himself to the cross. Just as she gave her life to nourish her children, so would the Savior give his body to be broken for humanity. Just as her crimson dye would run down the bark of the Kermes oak, staining her children, the precious blood of Jesus Christ would run down Calvary's tree, atoning for the sins of the world. In the stillness of the Mediterranean landscape, 
under the watchful eyes of the Kermes Oak. The Scarlet Worm told a story of salvation, a story that resonated with the longing of the human soul, one that whispered the name of Jesus. As the sun set over the ancient city of Jericho, casting a golden glow on its towering walls, Rahab stood by her window. The scarlet thread dyed crimson from the body of the scarlet worm she clutched in her trembling hands. The weight of the promise it held was not lost on her. It was a symbol of faith, a token of redemption, a sign of a covenant made with the God of Israel. With a heart filled with hope and eyes brimming with tears, she hung the scarlet thread in her window, its vivid hue a stark contrast to the pale stone of the city walls and the lifeless gods she once served. It was a declaration of her faith, a beacon in the spiritual darkness of her time, a lantern guiding her to a future she had never dared to imagine. As Rahab gazed at the scarlet thread, she could not have known the full extent of its significance. She could not have seen the echoes of her own story in the life cycle of the humble scarlet worm, the parallels between her redemption and the ultimate redemption that would come through Jesus Christ. But in that moment, as the scarlet thread swayed in the gentle breeze, she felt a connection to something eternal a bond with a God who knew her, loved her, and had reached out to her in her darkest hour. The scarlet thread was her beginning, her entry into the lineage that would lead to the birth of the Savior. It was a symbol of her transformation from a woman of shame to a woman of faith, from a life of bondage to a life of freedom. And as the city of Jericho fell, as the walls crumbled and the old was swept away, Rahab's faith stood firm, anchored by the scarlet thread, a thread that wove through history, through prophecy, to the very heart of God's redemptive plan. In the tapestry of salvation, in the grand design of God's love, the story of Rahab and the scarlet worm is a testament to the power of faith, the beauty of redemption, and the depth of a love that knows no bounds.